Okay, I'm going to take on a very challenging topic at this time. Um, I'm going to title this presentation, How to be Perfect. And um, the very word perfect is a daunting word. I have half an idea of what I'm saying because I've tried to be perfect for 39 years. Well, I, I tried to be perfect for 31 years. 31 years, I tried to be perfect. And, you know, recently I, I was doing a presentation where I talked about the joy that should be in the Christian life. How our life should be a, a life of rejoicing and happiness and thanksgiving. And somebody took me to task because the person said we are in the day of atonement and we are supposed to be mourning and weeping and afflicting our souls. I don't know how you respond to that, but there's some kind of logic in what this person said. It seems. Because on the day of atonement, people were supposed to fast and weep and afflict their souls. And how could I be saying that the Christian life is supposed to be joyous and thankful and rejoicing and taking hold of the victory that is ours in Christ when we are living in the day of atonement? And it sounds a little bit contradictory because both things should be true unless we are misunderstanding one or the other. But it made me think. For 170 years, Adventists have focused on the Day of Atonement and on obtaining this kind of perfection. In fact, I don't know if anybody can define this perfection that we are talking about, but I have had concepts in my mind of what it means. I, I suppose I got these ideas from the books I read, from people I talked to, from what I heard in the church, and from maybe my own distorted understanding. But my concept of perfection was that you need to work towards getting to a place where you never, you never even, one person said, I heard one person says, if you lick your fingers between meals, it's a sin. Because eating between meals is wrong. What is perfect? If you, if you drink and eat, it's a sin. In fact, somebody even showed me a statement that Ellen White said, it is a sin to be forgetful. And I tell you, when you start looking at perfection in that way, I mean, I heard that they, the Jews had 100 and four, 613 laws, the Hebrews. And I heard that the Catholics made a book where they, 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 they numbered 700 and something different sins that you can commit. But when you start thinking of perfection in terms of this, what you forget, licking your fingers between meals, taking a casual glance at something inadvertently as you pass by on the road, when you start measuring perfection by every single activity that is possible in the human sphere, every possible behavior, when you start measuring perfection in this way, it becomes a daunting task. I know. I sought it for 30 years. And I'm going to tell you, in all those 30 years, and as I read through the history of Seventh-day Adventism, I have never met one person who said, I reached the goal. And that perhaps is a, is, is, is a, is a, is a blessed thing, because if somebody had said it, everybody would have said, you are a liar. You know, I know, I know, I, I think I mentioned this morning, I, I'm not sure if I did it up here or somewhere else, but somebody, this lady said to me, are you a, a vegetarian? Did I say it here? Are you a vegetarian? I said, yes. She said, um, do you use milk and eggs? I said, yes. She says, I don't use milk and eggs. Right. And then I felt several degrees less perfect. <laughs> she, was, she was several uh, tears ahead of me in perfection. And that's how I saw perfection. That's how I looked for it. And I found out what I think everybody who has looked in this direction has found out. That when you start trying to be perfect by your behavior, and you start measuring perfection by every minute detail of your life, if that is your concept of perfection, I wish you luck. You will need lots of it. And it still won't be enough because nobody ever obtained perfection in that way. Something is wrong with that concept because it has not made anybody perfect in 170 years. Nobody. I've never met one. And, and 
we tried really hard. And I know people who have tried really hard. I know it drove some crazy, but it never made anybody perfect. So, I mean, I stopped thinking this way when I, when I came to understand righteousness by faith. In fact, I remember the very day when I, I first grasped the idea. I went to my wife and I said, Sweetheart, thank God I don't have to be perfect. That's what I said. That's not what I meant. That's what I said. That's how it came out. Because for 30 years, I've been trying to produce perfection out of David Clayton. I've been trying to make David perfect. I was trying to change myself. And that morning in my kitchen on the floor, it came to me like a bolt from the blue. You are trying to make the second Adam perfect? You don't need to become perfect. You need to enter into the perfect life. Perfection is already existent in a certain life. What you need is to receive that life, not to try to change the one that you have. You need to die, and the perfect one needs to live. And it struck me just so beautifully that if I could be born into that life, everything I had been searching for for 30 years could become mine as a gift. Wow, that blew me away. And that has been, that has been where I have been for the past Eight years rejoicing. I stopped trying to find what is already existing. I stopped trying to create what is already done. My task became the task of discovering how to believe the truth. And I've had everything I have been presenting for the past eight years. If you want to go back and look at it and you find a difference in my presentations, that has been the root of it. I learned about the gift and I stopped trying to create the gift myself. I stopped frustrating the grace of God. And I praise God that I came to this place. So I can rejoice. I can rejoice. Now, I want you to look at the biblical concept of perfection. The New Testament concept. Because the New Testament does use the word a few places. And I believe very strongly that our, our ideas should be based on what the Bible says. Now, the first concept I want to look at is a concept as it is used concerning Jesus, because I believe that will help us. Go to Hebrews chapter 10, chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. And I'm going to read there from verse 10. It says, For it became him, or it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. It's talking about God and Jesus, and it says it pleased God to make Jesus perfect through sufferings. So you discover something there. You discover that Jesus Christ, our Savior, was not perfect. Ha, ah, he was not perfect. Because it says he was made perfect by suffering. And yet we understand that Jesus, was Jesus born imperfect? No, he wasn't born imperfect. So when the Bible says he was made perfect, it must mean in a certain sense. There's something that Jesus was not complete in. And he reached this place by suffering. So let's see what was this perfection. What was this perfection about? Go to Hebrews chapter 5. And we're going to read verses 8 and 9. Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9. Now here he's talking about Jesus again. And he's it's talking about Jesus uh, with particular reference to how Jesus is qualified to be our high priest. And it says in verse 8, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, there it says it again, being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. 
Now, I just want to mention in passing something striking. Notice that Jesus was not the author of eternal salvation until what? Until he was made perfect. Now, now, Jesus is said to be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world in Revelation 13 and verse 8. But you understand it's in the sense that he was promised. But he did not die at the foundation of the world. Jesus was not the savior of the world in actual fact until he was made perfect. So the word perfect here signifies perfect as our savior. He was not a perfect savior until he became man and suffered in our place and conquered temptation. Because he cannot save me from temptation unless he has first conquered temptation. So he's not a perfect savior until he has suffered temptation and learned obedience by the things that he suffers. So you see that perfection here has to do with perfection for a certain purpose. That's the first concept of perfection I want to focus on. The perfection that Jesus had. He was made perfect to be our savior. And I think this introduces the first idea that I want to, 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 to share with us. That perfection has to do with a certain purpose. Because if you think perfection means absolute immaculate perfection, you know what you're talking about? God! You're talking about God. There's nobody. In fact, there's a verse in the Bible that says that even the angels are not pure in his sight. Anybody remember that verse? All right, I, I don't have it at my fingertips. I won't push it, but it's in the Bible. That says that even the angels are not pure in his sight. But the point I'm making... Job. Say? Job says, Job says it. All right, okay. But um, the point I'm making is that when you talk about absolute immaculate perfection, only God qualifies or will ever qualify. So when we look at perfection as, as, as human beings, it must be perfection in a particular context. It cannot be unqualified perfection. Now, I just want to emphasize a little bit the point that Jesus became our Savior. He was qualified and became perfect as our Savior when he came to this earth. Look at um, Revelation 12 and verse 10. It says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation, and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. You can go back to the passage and read in context to find out when does this apply. When is it speaking about? But I can just look at the verse here that we just read, and there are certain things that jump out at you. First of all, it says, now is come salvation. I want to ask you, when is now? Brother John says Pentecost, and I'm going with what John says. I believe that this passage is speaking about Pentecost. But some people believe that it's referring to before the world was created. Because it says that the, the great dragon was cast out of heaven. And the voice says, now salvation has come. Salvation didn't come before the world began. In fact, there was no sinner on earth before the world began. This is talking about, as Brother John said, after the death of Christ. When Jesus returned to heaven and fought against the dragon and cast him out of heaven. And the loud voice says, now salvation has come. Now has come salvation and strength. The power of the Holy Spirit to God's people. And the kingdom of our God. The same kingdom that Jesus was saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the power of his Christ. Because that accuser, Satan, was cast out, which had been accusing them before God up in heaven day and night. He was finally kicked out of heaven permanently. And you know, that's what Jesus said. When Jesus was going to be crucified, some Greeks came to see him. And the disciples said, there are some people here wanting to see you. And Jesus says, the hour has come that the Son is, is to be glorified. Father, glorify your name. And the voice from heaven said, I have both glorified it 
and will glorify it. And Jesus says, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. He was talking about Satan, the prince of this world. He was about to be cast out of heaven. And that's what we see happening in Revelation 12 and verse 10 here. So, the point I'm making is that it says, Now is come salvation. Salvation had not come before. All the people who died before Jesus came died with the hope of salvation. They died with faith in a promise of salvation. We don't have a hope or a promise. We have salvation in our bodies. Jesus says, he, the, the Bible says, if you have the Son of God, you have eternal life. Already! Already! Jesus said to his disciples, as he, as he spoke to them of the coming Pentecost, he says, look here, at that day, because I live, you shall live also. He said, anybody who drinks of this water, it will be a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. He spoke of our experience in the Christian experience as a living reality of everlasting life. Eternal life is in us. Amen. Yeah, we, we have lived, we poor, underprivileged, second class, 21st century Christians living like paupers because we don't understand or believe what the Bible says we possess. That's the pure truth. Like I said this morning, we have been so long in darkness, we're just barely getting our noses above, above the muck. But it's true. It's biblical. It's the reality of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. We, salvation came with Jesus. He was perfected and became the author of eternal salvation. That's why Paul says, look here, I want you to understand something. I want you to know the power of his resurrection. The power of the resurrection is where Jesus sits at the right hand of God. Read Ephesians chapter 2. It says, I, I pray God, I bow my knees to the, the God and Father that your, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you might know the height and the depth of what God has done for you when he raised Jesus from the dead and took him to his own right hand at the side of the Father in heavenly places. He's saying, that's what I want you to understand. What was done for you when God did that? The power and the privilege that is God's people is equated, is understood by the power that is available to Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father in the resurrection power. There is, there, there is so much there when you begin to understand this that it's overwhelming. Look at what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And verse 10. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10. He says. Therefore. I endure all. I endure all things. For the elect's sake. That they may also obtain the salvation. Where? Which is. In Christ Jesus. With eternal glory. The, 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 the misconception I had all the, 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 the earlier years was that I need to work out salvation by my continued struggle in my daily life. I needed to forge salvation. Yes, Jesus will help you. Yes, Jesus died to take care of the legal part of it. But you need to work this thing out. Nobody ever made me understand that when I gave myself to Christ, his life became my life. Nobody made me understand that. Or if I heard it somewhere, it never sunk in. Nobody emphasized it and made me understand that. It's not just, it's not just the paperwork that is a gift. The actual life of victory is a gift from God received by faith through his son. Nobody made me understand this. I really began to got it. I really began to get it when I learned the truth about the Godhead, started to study it and recognize that the Holy Spirit is the life of Jesus Christ Himself. So Jesus, what, what I'm being told is that it is Jesus Christ who lives in me, the same life that He once lived here, that He conquered sin with, 
2,000 years ago, then it began to dawn on my mind what salvation is really about. And it has grown more beautiful every day since. So, Jesus was perfected. He faced sin, and as, as, as Brother Rocky was reminding me today, Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are. Was he tempted in all points like as we are for himself or for me? He obtained the victory for me. That's how, that's why he had to be perfected so he could become my savior. Because if he never faced sin, he could not deliver me from sin. Doesn't the Bible say that? We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. But he was tempted as we are, so he's qualified to be my savior. I'm going to tell you, if I come from the ghetto and I'm suffering under addiction, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a crack addict, and you come to tell me, man, this is easy to overcome. It's, it's better and more convincing if you have been an addict and you overcame it, right? But a man who has lived an easy life all his life and you, you are poverty stricken and suffering and he comes and says, never mind, man, you can bear it. You just, just keep your chin up. And I think it's easy for you to say. He's not going to convince you. God sent his son into our place to first of all be the pioneer of what victory over sin means. Not just to give us an example, but to produce the life that he could pass on to us in which this element of victory exists. I'm not trying to overcome sin. I possess the power in myself. He that hath the Son hath eternal life. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me because it is not I but Christ who liveth in me. I can't overcome sin but Christ has defeated sin. So see what the Bible says now. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. And read verse. Let's read verse 14. It says of Jesus. For by one offering. He hath perfected forever. Them that are sanctified. What is that word? perfected for how long where is your perfection in Christ Jesus is it something that he will do or something he has done past tense my perfection exists already in Jesus Christ if I don't experience it in my life it's because I don't have the faith to take what belongs to me the Christian life is the fight of faith. The good fight of faith, not the bad fight of works. I am not qualified to fight sin and I never was. I can't develop by fighting sin. My fight is a fight of faith. My fight is a fight to take what already belongs to me by believing in the gift of God. Let's go, well, I don't need to read this, but I, I'm, I'm just going to mention it. You know, I just said that those who lived before Jesus never had this salvation. But they had the promise of it, and they died with the hope of it. I just want to give you a verse to back up what I said, and I think most of you know this. But let's read it, let's read it anyway. It's in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. And the last two verses. Verses 39. Now it says that it talks about people like Samson and Jephthah and Moses and Abraham and Enoch and Elijah and David and Rahab and all these people. And it says, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, that's what they got, a good report, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. What the passage says is that these men, you think of them as the heroes, right? Elijah, Moses, Daniel. The Bible says they died without receiving the promise. They did not receive the promise of the seed, of the Messiah, of the Savior. 
They were not perfected because Jesus did not come to produce that perfect life. They died without receiving it. We are the first, we, we who, who live this side of the cross have obtained this perfection before they did. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 11 and verse 11, he says, look here. Of those who were born of women, nobody is greater than John the Baptist. But what? But the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. That kingdom came at Pentecost. Everybody who has received the resurrected life of Jesus Christ is greater than anybody who lived before. Now let me pause a little bit. I know the Spirit of God existed in the Old Testament. I believe even that God was working through Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. He was the angel of the Lord. Peter says the Spirit of Christ was speaking to those people back then. So I'm not saying the Spirit of Christ didn't exist in the Old Testament. I am saying the resurrected, victorious life of Jesus Christ did not exist in the Old Testament. The God-man did not exist in the Old Testament. A human being who had completely conquered sin did not exist in the Old Testament. Christ could not be our Savior until he had passed through our experience. So he, that life was not available in the Old Testament. The comforter that came at Pentecost was a brand new manifestation of the life of Jesus Christ. It was a new person, as it were. So, so they never received the salvational aspect of Jesus in the Old Testament. That's what I mean. That's why Paul says in Romans 5 and verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now, of course, the word atonement here means reconciliation. He says we have now received the reconciliation. He's not talking about the Day of Atonement. I, I believe in that, and I may speak about that tomorrow a little bit, the Day of Atonement. But what he's saying is that we have now received the reconciliation. It was not done before. It's now. He's talking about after Jesus came. Now, I don't want to keep on hitting the law because... I have to say over and over again what Paul says. Now we know that the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. But, here's the but. Right, I don't want to do it, but the thing is that I don't want good to keep us from better. And I don't want better to keep us from best. That is a problem why I keep on putting the law back in the background because I'm dealing with people with an Adventist background who have been bred into the idea that our message is the law. And I'm telling you, with that mindset, you can't escape legalism. Even though Ellen White said, and Jones and Wagner said, and our history says, our message is Christ and his righteousness. Even though Ellen White said, this is a message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message in verity. Even though she said it, everybody says, yes, it is true. And then they go forth to proclaim the law. It's not, it's not your statements. It's the practicality of how you live your life and how you focus your life that determines what happens to you and what happens to the people that you infect around you. So I have to keep emphasizing this so that we get it. You really have to put Jesus in the middle of your mind and before your eyes and around your life and uh, into the people that you encounter day to day. Jesus really has to be a living personality oozing out of you Amen. and affecting everybody around you. And you can't do it by making him an appendage when you talk about the law. You can't. He has to become the center. So... I have to keep making the contrast. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, 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 when you grasp it, you're going to, going to see that the New Testament is full of it. The law was given by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. 
This mountain, Mount Sinai, represents Rahab. Jerusalem, which is above, is the mother of us all. Hagar. Hagar. And we look at another one, Hebrews 7 and verse 19. Hebrews 7 and verse 19 says, For the law made nothing perfect. But look at the rest of it. But the bringing in of a better hope did. Did what? Did make perfect past tense. Did make perfect by the which we draw nigh unto God. I didn't make that contrast. The Bible makes the contrast. The law made nothing perfect. But God brought in a better hope that did make perfect. And through this better hope we draw near to God. Hebrews 7 and verse 11. The same chapter. Verse 11. It says, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What is he saying? He's saying, look here. The Aaronic priesthood and the priest never made anything perfect. Perfection was not that way. And he's pointing out that it was under this priesthood that the law came. So therefore, if this priesthood no longer exists, then the thing that they represented, the thing that they, they ministered, they ministered the law, cannot be the thing that we are dealing with today because the Levitical priesthood is gone. And in fact, a little later down, I don't have the verse here. But a little later down in that same chapter, it says, For the priesthood being changed, what else? There is made also of necessity a change in the law. Now, grant you, he's not focusing on the Ten Commandments. Grant you. But what he's focusing on is the system of the law that governed the people. It made nothing perfect. It says, if therefore perfection, verse 11, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? So he's saying the, Mel the, the Levitical priesthood and its law made nothing perfect. That's why God called a priest after the Melchizedek priesthood who has made perfect. One more, Hebrews 10 and verse 1. And I could read several. In fact, I'm going to read two more. Hebrews 10 and verse 1. And this is the problem. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereon to perfect. Now I'm going to try to give you a little illustration here. Something I like to do because it's kind of close to my heart. Now, let me just take an indulgent moment here. This is my grandson. You've heard me talking about him, okay? All right. You need to know that since I've been here, my wife is here with me this year. I'm half contented. My, my half discontent is because of this little boy. Every morning we call him on Skype. But you see, he's a little boy. He's just a year and a half. He looks at Grandpa a little bit. And then he dashes off to play with his ball and he's not interested anymore. And I'm a little frustrated because if I was at home, I'd be playing ball with him. And not allowing him to get too far from me. So, uh, 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 Jen and I will look at the pictures a little bit. What does this do to me? You know what it mostly does? It frustrates me. Right? I look at it, yeah, but it frustrates me because you know what it does? It makes me long for the real thing. I can't play with this. It won't talk to me. I can only look at it and etch an image in my mind and wish that I had the reality. Now the word of God says the law had the shadow of good things. The law was like this. It was a photograph of real things. It was not real things. This can't satisfy anybody. Okay? It might remind you of the real thing, but what you need to bring you satisfaction is the real thing. The law having a shadow of good things and not the very things can never with those 
of those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the commas there unto perfect. We want perfection. Like I want to play with my grandson. We need perfection. God wants us to be perfect. And so what does he do? Tell you, kill, kill a lamb. Tell you to go into a, a place made out of goat skins and to burn incense. How does that make anybody perfect? Put ten rules on stone and tell you to obey them. Does that make you perfect? I tell you, the government does as much. The government tells you, don't steal or you're going to prison. The government tells you, don't break the speed limit. Don't kill anybody, otherwise you're going to be electrocuted. The government does the same, gives you rules. Does it make anybody perfect? Those things don't make you perfect. They only give you a shadow of the real thing. But look, a shadow represents a reality. And so you get in touch with the reality. We have a real high priest who, you, who, who has real blood and blood represents life. This high priest gives us his blood. He ministers his blood, meaning he imparts his life to you. Something comes into your body out of wherever heaven is or wherever Jesus is. Something comes into you and you are born again. And if you don't believe it is true, look at what happened at Pentecost. Do you think... They spoke Chinese and Japanese and German and, and Greek and Parthian and whatever. You think it was by studying something or by just being enthusiastic? Some power came into their bodies. You think Peter just suddenly became brave and bold and stood up against those people and said, we ought to obey God rather than men, when a few days before he ran from a little servant girl who said, you are one of them? Something came into that man's mind and body and transformed him into a new creation. That is the reality that the blood only represented. The ten sentences on stone, God says, I will put my law in your heart and in your mind. He didn't mean ten sentences. He meant, I'm going to change your nature, that you're going to behave without even needing to read the Ten Rules. That is perfect. That is perfection. That is what makes perfect. The law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw an eye unto God. Now I'm going to add an, a, another dimension to this concept of perfection in just a moment. But first of all, I want to look at two concepts, two concepts of what this perfection means. And um, Hebrews 6 and verse 1, and I'm spending a lot of time in the book of Hebrews because this book talks a lot about perfection. Hebrews 6 and verse 1. Now verse 1 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Now that sounds like you progress from one stage to another, and it does. It does say this. But look at how you progress. He says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. So you have repentance from dead works, faith towards God, and what next? Okay, you have some more there later on. But he says we are to go on on to perfection. What does he mean by go on unto perfection? Because obviously there's a foundation that comes and you step off that foundation and you go to perfection. That's how I understand it. You start with a foundation, which is you repent. Repentance means I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry I've been such a terrible person. I'm sorry I've been such a reprobate. So you're sorry for your sins and then you have faith towards God. And Paul says these are the foundation. And from the foundation now, you step into perfection. He says, move on to perfection. And that's what I want to examine. What is this concept of perfection? Let's go back to um, Hebrews 10. Back to that verse we just read. And I'm going to add a little bit to it. Let me read it again. And we read, we read a little further this time. My love, am I talking too fast? A little bit. All right. She is my moderator. She says, I've been talking a little too fast. And I'm trying, but sometimes I get excited. 
It says in verses 1 to 3. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereon to perfect, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Now, when we read the Bible, we should not read like children. We should read with discrimination. Think about what is being said. The apostle says that every year they had to remember the sins again and again because the sacrifices did not do what? Did not what? Did not make them perfect, but it did not, did not give them freedom in their consciences from sin. If those sacrifices had made them perfect, they would have had no more awareness of sin. And so next year, there would have been no need to offer more sacrifices. What does that suggest about the sacrifice of Christ? It suggests that when the one true sacrifice comes, there is never any more repetition. Why? What about your conscience? Because your conscience is freed from sin forever. You are no longer sin conscious. All right, let me see if I'm exaggerating this. Because the thing about the Bible is that it doesn't just give you one witness. Look at Hebrews 9 and verse 9. And you see something similar being said. We're going to look at a few verses with regard to this. But look at what it says. Hebrews 9 and verse 9. It talk, it's talking about the sanctuary. And it says, Which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect. How? As pertaining to the conscience. Okay. So this is the kind of perfection that we're talking about. Perfection of conscience. Okay. Not absolute immaculate perfection that belongs to God alone. Perfection of conscience. I can get there. I can experience that. I can say to God, yes, when he says go, I can say yes, I can have a clean conscience. This perfection is realistic. Look again at Hebrews 9 and verse 14. Same chapter 9, verse 14. It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, that's the spirit of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You see in the New Testament, a different standard of right and wrong is being put before you. And that standard is what? Your conscience. That standard is, is your relationship with, to God and your loyalty to God, your conscience. Do you know that if, God, if you go to this job and God says, I don't want you to work here. Do you know that if you go and take that job, do you know you have, you have rebelled against God? Do you know that's as serious a sin as killing somebody? Do you know that if you go to eat something and, and the Lord says, I don't want you to eat this. And do you know that if you eat it, it's as serious as telling a lie or breaking any of the Ten Commandments? Because you are wounding your conscience. Because you are saying to God, I will not have this man to control my life. Do you know that when you believe that salvation, it's about the law, you obey ten rules and the rest of your life belongs to you? And you live your life and you think that's okay. When you are just as much in rebellion against God, obeying ten rules. That is a religion for children. The religion of Christ is that you have a new person in charge of your body. And because you trust him, you give yourself away to him and you say, anything you want of me, anything, I am yours. Amen. That is what true righteousness means. 
It doesn't mean you know everything. It doesn't mean every behavior is immaculate. It means that your conscience is clean in your relationship to God. That is realistic perfection, and that is what God is looking for. And when a man is perfect in this way, he is ready for eternity. Amen. And if you keep all the commandments that are in the Old Testament, 613 of them, and you retain control of your own will, you will never make it into glory. The rich young man sensed this. And he came to Jesus and he said, What shall I do that I might have eternal life? Jesus says, You know the commandments. Keep the commandments. And he said, Lord, what did he say? All these things I have done from my youth up. He was a commandment keeper. But he knew he was lacking something. What lack I yet? And Jesus says, Jesus knew that he had to find a way to get this man to get the message. And so he said he knew that the man's God was his money. The man's God was his money. He took the thing that was to the man like how Isaac was to Abraham. And he said, sell everything that you have and give to the poor and follow me. I don't, he didn't want the man's money. He wanted the man's heart. But to get to the heart, he had to touch the man's God. And the man revealed the truth. I want salvation but I don't want you controlling my life. I'll keep the commandments if you, if, if you want, but I don't want you to take over my life. And he went away sorrowful. And this is, this is, a, this is the issue, a conscience. Some place where not even my wife can intrude. When a man is before God with a clean conscience, brothers and sisters, that's a place you ought to be. And no external pos- uh, force can put you there. The pastor doesn't, can't intrude in that place. No church elder or church brother has a right to intrude in that place. And that is why less and less I talk about people's behavior. And I talk more about their relationship to Christ. You know, there was, there was a sister who came to our congregation. Well, I shouldn't even mention this. I don't want to step on people. Well, I can't think... It, I'm going to ignore, I don't know anything, I'm just going to say it, okay? In our congregation, the sisters don't wear jewelry, okay? And the sister came and she, 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 she came for a year and she wore these heavy earrings and nobody said anything to her. And she was welcomed as a sister and we greeted her, nobody said anything. We all were happy with this sister. And one e- after one year, the earrings disappeared. Nobody said a word. And I was happy for that. Because I believe we are not to be conscious to people. Because I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking. And you don't need to become a God to anybody else. Yes, I agree. There are some things that are so extremely outrageous that they will bring a scar upon the name of Christ and you might have to talk to somebody about something okay but generally speaking there are minor things that we make to be a huge mountain because it offends us but we need to leave people for the Lord to speak to their consciences because even if they do what you want them to do because you say so it doesn't help their relationship with God at all there's there's still a problem with them and God because they have not done it for their conscience's sake they have done it for your sake. And that is a problem because you have become God to these people. And that certainly is not your place. So it says that the issue is really the conscience. Look at how Paul puts it. First Timothy 1 and verse 5. This probably is the most beautiful verse I will read tonight. It says, Now the end of the commandment, or the word end here, what could I substitute for it? The goal or the purpose of the commandment. In other words, what God wanted to accomplish. The goal of the commandment is charity, love, that comes from a pure heart and of a good conscience and faith unfeigned. Faith that is not pretended. This is Christianity. Love that comes from a pure heart 
a good conscience, and faith that is not pretentious. This is Christianity. When you possess the love of God that comes from a, a heart without hypocrisy or without, without guile, a pure heart, that comes from a good conscience, that you are not listening to what, you know, I can always work my way around the law. I always could do it. I can sit down and watch something on television. Which law tells me thou shalt not watch TV? Which law? Why do you think so many Adventists have the most vile things on their computer or on their television screen? Which of the commandments says thou shalt not? You can find ways around the law. But man, you got to go talk to God that night. And when you go to pray, if you pray in sincerity, you know that there is a block standing between you and him. You can fool everybody. You can't fool your conscience. So God takes the bottle to the innermost sanctuary where it really belongs into your conscience. And he says, deal with that. When you have a clean conscience, that's all God asks for you of you. It's when you come to the place that you say to God, my daddy, it's you and me alone. It's you and me alone. And I don't care if my wife says it is okay. And I don't care if the pastor says so. And I don't care if brother David says it's all right. Between you and me, my father, I don't hear you saying it is okay. So I can't go with it. That's when you are safe. That's, what the, that's the end of the commandment. And that's what it means to be perfect. Now, now this is a place we are at when we surrender and we receive the life of Jesus. Our consciences are clean because it is now him living instead of us. And this is how it works its way, its way out. It works its way out in a faithfulness to conscience. That's why Abraham had to go through with killing Isaac. Don't you think he could have justified it a thousand ways? God, you promised me this son. That can't be your voice. You can give me this son and then tell me to go and kill him. Or he could simply have told Sarah and she would have gone for the axe and said, touch him if you are bad. Sarah, you think he could have left the home with Isaac if Sarah knew he was going to kill Isaac? No, no, no. He would have had to go through Sarah. So he didn't tell Sarah he was going to kill Isaac. He took Isaac and headed for the mountain. And all the way for three days, God gave him three days for it to soak in. For him to get all the excuses in his head. For him to get all the arguments in his head. Why he shouldn't do this. Why the commandment says thou shalt not kill. This cannot be God. But you know the thing is. Conscience. He knew the voice of God. He knew the voice of his friend. He could not lie to himself. And this is why. He went forward. In spite of the pain. He went forward. And. He proved at the end that God was number one in his life, even against the joy of his heart, Isaac. And that is what it means to truly give our lives to God. Now it says in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 19, Hebrews 1 and verse 19. It says, Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Do you understand what this is saying? You will destroy your faith if you are not true to your conscience. You will destroy your faith. And that is why we can't approach God in a legal way because I can find arguments to get away from the, the law. When the law says do this or don't do this, I can find arguments around it. But I can't get away from my conscience. When I start killing my conscience, I'm going to make shipwreck of my faith. That's what Paul says happens. Okay? So I'm going to read the last verse. Hebrews 10 and verse 22. 
It says, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. That's what I want to leave with you this evening, brothers and sisters. When you have come to Christ, and you have believed, and you have received Jesus Christ, your consciences have been sprinkled with clean water. You no longer have an evil conscience, and when you don't have an evil conscience, this is what it means to be perfect in God's eyes. The person who does not have an evil conscience has all the perfection necessary to take him into heaven. Amen. That is why you can say today, I have salvation. I know where I belong. You don't have to say like those poor misguided people who are depending on their works. I hope I will make it. I am not yet ready, but I hope to be someday. You can say today, because there's another place. I didn't have this verse, but, but the verse says, if your hearts condemn you, God is greater than your heart. If your conscience condemns you, you expect God to set you free? You expect the law to justify you when your conscience tells you that something is wrong? But if your heart does not condemn you, God knows your heart. God knows when you are true in your commitment to him. And that is all he asks. A man who says to God, you can have my life, is fit to be saved. Even if he's keeping Sunday. Even if he has three wives. As long as he's true to his conscience. There will come a time when God will say, did you know that it was not my plan for you to keep Sunday? And he says, really? Which day? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Just tell me. I am yours. Anything you say, anywhere you go, I am yours. That man doesn't need anything but a little education. A little education is not stopping you from being saved. God is concerned about your heart, not your intellect. You will never know everything. But if you know enough to give God your heart, you are savable. Thank God. I hope we never forget this. Because it puts us in a place where we have continual joy in our hearts and lives, even though we are living in the Day of Atonement. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Let us pray.